Blood satellite. Can you come here for a sec? Come here, come here, honey, come here. Can you just say, can you just say, the West has fallen? The West has fallen. Thank you, honey. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Okay, we got a new drop for that. <laughs> that one, I'm I'm releasing that one to the channel too. That's for anyone to use. <laughs> we got, everyone's gonna be like third mic. You know what? Fuck it, replace dimes. I know it's coming. <laughs> it's just the du- the Judas and Judas daughter podcast. Yeah. Look, I I in before you, so you you can't say that anymore. I got it. Yeah. Um. <laughs> what were you, what was I saying about Andrew? Oh, I was going to say, if I went back in time to the 1970s and showed a young man of like 16, 15, and showed him a Nick Fuentes video, these children would beat the shit out of me. If I showed them an Andrew Tate video, if I showed them videos of the types of guys that we're into now, they would they would think I'm retarded and insane. Right, I yeah, would feel embarrassed yeah. to show even these Absolutely. fucking like boomer kids the types of Absolutely. gay shit that we that 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 counts as a revolutionary. Even even from like the I think the early two thousands, you know, I think even if you show, I mean, maybe I'm giving us too much credit, but I think if you showed us this, you know, ten years ago, fifteen years ago, we already would have hated it. Like, it's something about it's something about. So something that's happened very, very recently, like in the last 10 years, that everybody has become really soft on this. Or maybe it's the, you're just starved for heroes. I don't know. <laughs> no, but I think, I think you're right. Like, I, I, as I'm talking about it now, and I'm sure there's always like embarrassing people all through a time, but I'm like, this crop of people that are being reported on in the news, like, we should be beating the shit out of them. Like Andrew Tate is a, a goofy faggot. Like so is Nick Fuentes. So are all these people? Oh, yeah. They suck, and they're yeah. not cool, and they're they're odd. And you see them in public, and they don't move right. Like you said, you see Andrew Tate walk through a door. He doesn't walk through a door properly. Yeah, like even like I, I'm always pissing on our like smaller niche celebs in our scene. But like I don't I don't mean it. Like most of the most of the guys that I'm making fun of that are in our sphere are a hundred times the man that fucking Nick Fuentes and Andrew Tate are, right? Like this is like we probably have better people in our chat than most of these talking heads that actually get national media coverage. I, I it's just crazy. I don't think that's unique to our chat. I think it's like there's some weird selection mechanism that's going on that's picking almost the worst possible people. Like they're clowns. I mean, like actual clowns, like jesters. You know what I mean? Like they've been put there as a target and like both sides are kind of throwing tomatoes at them at the same time. Except that also our guys are sucking their dick. So you know, th- know. There's something to that though. There's something to, uh, I know, uh, I think it was Paul Fahrenheit. He had a post and this is one of the, his posts that enraged me, but it was so perfectly constructed to enrage me. I must respect it. <laughs> but it was something about... He was defending self-help books and he's saying that the self-help movement, which had, traces its roots back many, many decades, was a quintessentially American phenomena. And in fact, he said something along the lines of, you know, the self-help books are some of the greatest literature that, you know, we've ever produced, something like that. And that immediately makes me angry, probably makes you yeah. angry. Yeah. But, course. you know, there is something to it that there there is this phenomena that... When I think of the Andrew Tates, I also think of the Tony Robbinses. I do think of the self-help. Even Jordan Peterson, to an extent, is very clownish, right? Uh, even though he's like a clownish version of it. He doesn't even seem like an academic, really, because if you've been in academia, he was even on the more autistic end of academia. He's too a little too quirky, a little too kind of silly and stuff. Yeah, and now that he's got the media manager, like he's got the big colorful tie and the fucking uh, the two face suit and the whole thing, like he's he's actually a clown now. Yeah, but like trace this back to all the maybe I think Dale Carnegie is probably the exception because I think if you read How to Win Friends and Influence People, that's really all you need. 
I think to to accomplish what the title wants you to. But I'm like going back. It's always been these like really the snake oil salesman. I think that was the core archetype of the snake oil salesman that is still somehow intoxicating that people still and maybe it's just America. I don't think it is just America. I think you see this in South America. I think you'd see this in Asia, too. But just the grifter, the con artist, the the loud excitable person but i'm like right now we do glorify that we glorify that to a degree that i i don't know why we do that and we're all yeah. aware of it we all we're all aware of like the hustle university type guys where you know take my course and i'll teach you how to be a millionaire i'll teach you how to be a billionaire are you a billionaire no but i know how to be one because i know like things that don't make any sense right out the gate but they're still so popular. Millions and millions of people follow them. And, and they do become rich by telling you how to become rich. And that is it's, and it's the influencer phenomenon. And this ties directly into the phenomenon we have right now of the NFT grifts, of the of, of these influencers, these nobodies, totally getting, getting people excited about it, releasing an NFT, doing a rug pull later, milking millions of dollars out of their fans, and their fans don't go anywhere. Yeah. Yeah, there's no way a picture of a rock is worth millions of dollars. But this is sort of what's so annoying right now about this new wave of influencers who are making waves by announcing in massive headlines that they just purchased super expensive NFTs like Logan Paul. Quote, just dropped 188 ETH, $623,000 on this one of one bumblebee. Probably nothing. And this is the JPEG. And this whole attitude and approach is about flipping NFTs for profit and eventually making money. And the endless speculation on what's going to be the next hyped up NFT. And that's where the scam is. It feels like every day a new celebrity announces an NFT project that you've just got to buy. They hype you up, send you to a Discord group, and they promise you a roadmap, riches, and b****. In other words, they promise you the world that is right up to the day of the mint. But I want to know what happens after that, after everyone buys in. What happens to the thousands of fans who just invested into their favorite celebrity? Do they go to the moon and get rich? Or do the fans lose money? If you pay attention to both the Hollywood trades and the crypto press and smoke enough weed, you can begin to pick out the contours of an expanding, interconnected, celebrity-based NFT scam. Circling back to that clip, Jimmy Fallon is represented by the Creative Artist Agency, one of the country's most exclusive talent agencies for Hollywood sport and business talent. For some reason, this talent agency also happened to invest $20 million into OpenSea, the NFT marketplace that board apes are traded on. Okay, at first glance, this isn't that weird. A talent agency owns part of an NFT platform and a famous talk show host is jumping on the NFT trend. All those celebrities I mentioned earlier, LaMelo Ball, Mark Cuban, Steph Curry, Justin Bieber, Snoop Dogg, just so happened to belong to the exact same exclusive talent agency. One funny detail, while the floor price or the minimum price board apes can be sold for today is $278,000, of the dozens of CAA celebrities I found that owned board apes, none paid more than $10,000, and some, like Mark Cuban, literally never bought theirs. His NFT, Board Ape number 1597 was created on May 1st, 2021, then transferred for free to Mark Cuban's account later that month. And that $20 million investment CAA made into the OpenSea marketplace, the negotiations for that deal just so happened to take place at the exact same time all these celebrities were being handed near free NFTs. What the fuck? That What the fuck is, is uh, what's that guy's name? Andrew Paul? Uh, Logan Paul, Logan the fighter. Paul. Oh man, what the fuck is Logan Paul? Why isn't Logan Paul hanging from a fucking street lamp? Watch the Coffeezilla documentary about him, him about how he scammed millions from his fans, oh, and man. nothing, nothing happened. They like him more for it because that's just part of the hustle. Raping me is part of the hustle. That's yeah. fucking. I. What is that? I don't understand that. Yeah, Logan Paul should be shot. He should be put down for sure trying to make comparisons i can't think of a lot but like say martin luther king right martin luther king was a hustler and a pimp and a piece of shit and most of what he told people was a lie 
but he became a folk hero for all the wrong reasons, but he did become a folk hero and he had a certain amount of legitimacy. Like he was backed by the churches. He was backed by the institutions, shaking hands with presidents that were flying them all over the world. That is just, and to give them a, give them a break. He was very masculine and he spoke well. He gave great speeches. He didn't write them, but I mean, he gave great speeches. So there was something where if you didn't look behind the curtain, it was easy to believe that Martin Luther King actually was a great leader of men. And he was somebody to look up to, especially if you were black or you were a left winger, right? But with, that's the, the transition is with these guys, they don't have any of that. They don't have the backing of institutions. They're, they don't give great speeches. Most of their content isn't even that well prepared or edited. It's all off the cuff. They're not very masculine. They're not usually very attractive. They don't carry themselves well. Like they're not exemplars as men in any way. And they don't have, they may talk about leadership and are about money and achievement, but none of them actually have it. And it's obvious, is this, this is the big, I think the main change, is it's obvious that, that they don't have any of that. It's not like they tricked you into believing it. Like they literally, if there's any trick, it's that they just said it. But if you use your fucking eyes, it's obvious that it's false. Like, like Tate saying that he's like a millionaire, when it's obvious he's sitting in a Romanian hotel room and he, he has to do his own laundry. Like... Uh, so yeah, I think that's the key, the key thing that I'm trying to figure out is how did we get from a, 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 a stable of grifters who could grift, but in order to grift, they had to be really fucking legitimate and convincing. And now we have a stable of grifters who could literally just be any random guy. And there's no guile at all. Like it's, it's really, it's a shame on us. It's a shame on our side that we're falling for it. And I don't understand. Yeah, that's what I don't understand. Yeah. Okay, so. and, and even with the Kanye West thing, like we've always kept Kanye West at arm's length. That And like, I like Kanye West for certain things, but I'm like, if you hitch your horse to that wagon, like you're, you're in for a downfall. And there's a lot of people who still did it. And I'm, I'm really disappointed. Like, not a lot of people that I know, but I've seen, you know, various influencers, even on the right. I'm like, have you learned nothing? Like, you're supposed yeah. to know better than this. And that's a fallen out of the news cycle now, but that's exactly what we predicted. Like, this is crazy nigger says crazy nigger stuff. Now, Broken Clock is right twice a day, so this time he's hating on Jews. Fine. That's cool and funny. But it's, yeah, people are like, oh, man, this man should be president. It's like, what the fuck are you talking about? An hour ago, he was your existential enemy. And now just because, and he's known to be a crazy person. Now be, this crazy person says something that lines up with what you like to say. One thing, one thing that, that you like, which is fuck the Jews. And now he, like you literally want him to lead an army for you. Like that's, in, that's insane. And I, I, it, it's an indictment of how fallen and broken we are, I think. So, yeah, it's us trying to, you know, you learn so much about elite theory. You learn so much about the history of empires and sovereignty that you just start looking for sovereigns and empires everywhere. <laughs> you start throwing in with uh, the, the hyper real things. You start throwing in with anyone who shows up and says something kind of like what you want. Just you're, you're so desperate. And there, there's no shortage of people in our scene who want to believe that the elites as you know however we define them the illuminati the people in in power are within reach that sometimes they think that the illuminati are already listening to them and already like kind of their friends like i got i know a lot of people in the scene who think like you know i know people in positions of power listen to me and sub to my channel like there's a lot of people who like when Trump was elected said, oh, they li he listens to my show or as someone's yeah. on the payroll, listen to my show. He's getting talking points from me. And even at the time, like that's dumb. Uh, wh what? <laughs> but even it, that never stopped. There's still people like that. But we, we get so excited about our imagined proximity to power that I think it allows us to create these blind spots. That somewhat ties into the book I wanted to cover. And there's a lot to cover. I might not be able to cover it all this time, but I'm going to give you the hits because this is one of those books I, re I really, really liked. Um, and uh, I can't recommend it enough to people. It's by the illustrious Joseph de Maestra. And I have my, and he's written a lot of things. There's a lot by Joseph de Maestra out there. The collection that I'm referring to was published by Imperium Press. 
It's called Just Major Works Volume 1 by Joseph de Maestro. You can find it on ImperiumPress.org. It gathers uh, three pieces together that have a lot of uh, flow to them, so they make sense gathered together on the topic of sovereignty. So I'll just say the three pieces are, the first is generative principle of political constitutions. The second is considerations on France, and this is largely in, involving the French Revolution. The third is study on sovereignty. And so he talks a lot about the French Revolution. He talks a lot about the Enlightenment. And he's called, um, I'll just read it a little bit about him on the back, because uh, I think it gathers up the points pretty well. It says, Joseph de Maistre is one of the greatest of all reactionary thinkers. And in this volume, three of his principal works are brought together on a bridge. A leading voice defending the traditional order of throne and altar, Maistre distinguished himself as a political commentator, a commentator in considerations on France and the French Revolution. Ever the devout Catholic, Maestra argued uncompromisingly for traditionalism against the Enlightenment, and through his treatment of bloodletting and expiration, he has been often remarked upon by his critics. Too few have underlined his warmth, humor, and humanity. Uh, the reader discovers in him. But anyway, he's big on kings. He's big on monarchy. He is a Catholic. He's uh, a traditionalist. And a lot of his work, uh, I found, was in response to enlightenment thinkers uh for example you know there's one page here he's, ta he's talking about rousseau um and he mentions them by name and it's uh you know uh just a comment here hence it obviously follows that the whole theory of this his social contract meaning rousseau is a juvenile fantasy <laughs> He's like openly saying this is in reference to Rousseau talking about sort of the social contract about equality uh, and, you know, this sort of idea of a law before everything else and treating everyone, you know, justice being blind and all that. What is the origin of inequality and is this inequality justified? To answer this question, both Rousseau and de Maistre believe that you must go to the origins of society, because from that is how you will discover what the origins of inequality are. De Maistre identifies four different possible definitions of nature. The first is, nature is the divine manifestation of God, which shows up in everything in the world. The second is, nature is the principles established by God for how the world operates. The third, Nature is the totality of something, the entire world that we live in, but also the totality of smaller things, such as the nature of humans, or cats, or trees. And the fourth, nature may be used to describe the state of things prior to man acting on it, since man is an animal of action that changes the world around him. In many books on this show in the past, we have discussed monarchy, we've discussed you know, we went back to Rome, we discussed empires, we discussed, you know, the law of civilization and decay by Brooks Adams. We, we've gone pretty in depth, uh, you know, sometimes on the side of monarchy, sometimes not. But we've given monarchy its fair shake, I think. But and we talked about sovereignty, how it, how the idea of sovereignty and political sovereignty relates to the different political systems like anarchy, like democracy and things like that. But I, I never heard a really great description of what sovereignty is and its relationship to the monarchy so we'll uh, we'll read something you know defending uh the monarchy and they'll say you know the, the king wasn't really in charge he wasn't god or treated as god he was kind of in service of this sort of divine sovereignty of, of god but like what does that mean really what do, what do you really mean by sovereignty what do you mean that the king is himself a servant because that's what most people wouldn't imagine with a king but what is that? What does this sort of sovereignty actually mean? And the way I'll just describe it in short. Um, what he had said, and I, I want to carry this forward because it's such a, a good way to describe it, is that you know sovereignty is almost this this entity in itself that people occupy. And uh, the maestro had made a couple points. That he says there's really only two types of government. There's monarchy and there's oligarchy. Or rather, there's monarchy and aristocracy. He says that once in the book. There's only two. And he says, democracy is just you electing your aristocracy. 
right? You, you elect your people to essentially hold the positions of the aristocracy. And what we see in democracy in the West is that it becomes a class in itself, that you become the political class. You become, you know, in essence, like the Obamas, the Kennedys, you are essentially an aristocracy <laughs> at some point. There's functionally no difference between you and like barons and princes. And it, it didn't take long for you to get there. So he was saying that, you know, democracy is just it's not even a legitimate system of government it's just kind of an oligarchy slash uh, aristocracy with extra steps but you know then then there's obviously anarchy which wouldn't be a really a system at all at, by design but I, I liked saying that like you know to have this system you have to have this thing called sovereignty and it's either occupied by one or many and this is the 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 case that a lot of the nrx guys made that you know the one is usually better than the many <laughs> um th that that's it so if you're going to have it at all you might as well have the one um or have the one kind of in check by you know the others and he says that a sovereign can never be created all people can do is be an instrument of one sovereign to dethrone another and a sovereign can never be a plebeian is what he's saying and, and he, that makes an interesting point like the idea that a commoner could be the sovereign that's been promised at many points throughout the history that's what most revolutionaries say and we got into this when we discussed uh de juvenile you know the idea of like the high low versus the middle like the center of power then the outer concentric circle then the periphery where the people are usually when you see a revolution, it's it's like the intermediary powers or the military or the priest class or whatever kind of pretending that they're commoners, but they're not really. And very rarely, maybe with the exception of like the French Revolution, but rarely ever have you ever seen an actual grassroots revolution ever, 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 ever succeed. They're used as tools by the real leaders who happen to be usually members of that intermediary class anyway so he's like he's saying that you know even in this in this world of revolutions that we all live in the rules really haven't changed and that's what he was saying to a lot of the revolutionaries in france he was calling it saying look this you think this is going to be a people's revolution this is going to be no different than any other aristocratic revolution that you've had ever like aristocrats and uh you know the the priest class overthrow kings all the fucking time you know who doesn't really overthrow king usually unless the society falls is the people usually the only ever time you'll see like the people overwhelm and destroy you know the sovereign entity is when the nation falls and he makes a good point later on in the book and maybe i'll say this now and just get it out of the way at the top because I, th I think this is sort of the message I, I really took from it where he said like this is why revolutions are often used by the enemies of a nation against the nation itself Tur and that's what we do right now and that's what America often does with color, color revolutions it's like when you as a people attack the sovereignty of your own nation you're essentially fucking yourself we talked about this before actually we talked about this last episode about how like if you are trying to like if you're an american trying to destroy america like you're just gonna there's no home for you elsewhere right you're, you've been tricked into destroy to surrendering your own sovereignty to surrendering your own power essentially and that you've gotten convinced that by relinquishing your power that relinquishing your power to someone else will be better for you and it never ever ever is so he says like you know you can you try and work within your system but if you actually attack your own system at the roots it's like it, it's probably going to end up worse for you later and you're never going to get that sovereignty back you're basically going to make yourselves into slaves is what he's saying and some people might uh <clears throat> might disagree with that but i think there's a lot of historical evidence to back that up um and he says like okay what is a sovereign and we kind of have to go back to these ancient, you know, we look at these monarchies, like they didn't just drop out of the sky one day. They're usually generated organically over time, you know, tribes unite. And and usually this is why the foundation myths of every nation can trace the roots back to an individual. Usually it's one guy or maybe a couple guys uh, throughout time. But he says sovereigns are divinely selected because they appear to arise without violence and without deliberation and i always liked that when he said that that was interesting how and this is where he ties it into divinity 
where he says like the sovereignty, this entire almost ontological concept of sovereignty to him is one to one with God. So he says, you know, there's this thing called this entity called sovereignty that must be occupied by an individual. And who usually gets to occupy that? Well, usually, you know, some people try and take it by force. It's usually not them. Um, those are usually dictatorships that fall apart soon. But if you are truly a king or truly like a great leader of a nation, you tend to arise organically from the people. And we see this throughout time that some leaders, even in America, they, they were able to take power without threats. They just had they had something. There was something about them. They were the best way I could describe it was they were the man for their time and place. And they might not be able to exist in any other time or any other place, but for one reason or another, if you look at the history of America, you look at India, you look at anywhere, usually their great leaders arose some almost magically, almost divinely. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. And even if you don't want to go the God route or go through the true divinity, you could say that the great leaders do seem to just emerge on their own or emerge without like conquest. And that's where I think there is sort of like a like like a force at work there that's interesting. Many in the modern day might mock Demaestra's belief that constitutions are divinely inspired and carried out in a religious fashion. They might mock the idea that only religion can bind people into a constitutional order. But generally then they go about their day living by a cultural constitution that is very clearly reflecting a progressive worldview, very clearly being driven and animated by the progressive religious spirit. Our obsession with progress and logical systems and proceduralism made us forget what a constitution actually is. It's a reflection of the spirit and nature and culture of its people. It is not some permanent, ironclad fix for the human condition. It's not some piece of technology that solves the problem of a fallen humanity. When we started treating the Constitution as the soul of our nation, when we started imbuing it with all of our hopes, with all of our faith, that is when we fell into a hollow proceduralism. He's got a, a few rules about... Um monarchy and about sovereignty and it's about how this is sort of anti-law and anti-legislation because he's responding to the enlightenment by saying look we can just craft these new laws and craft this new social contract to dictate what the best world is for all men across the world so he's against that he's more of a particularist but he's also like you cannot just conjure up systems that systems that govern men need to be generated over time from within. And we talked about this when we discussed the construction of nationhood by Adrian Hastings. Same sort of thing. It needs to be it needs to be organically done to, to such a point where it might as well be divinely ordained. But it cannot be like the brainchild of a council. You see what I'm saying? So he's got he's got like a list of uh, requirements here. <clears throat> he says like one. No constitution results from deliberation. The rights of the people are never written or only as simple declarations of pre-existing unwritten rights. That's the first one. The second one is human action is circumscribed in these sorts of cases to the point that men who act are only circumstances. Uh, the rights of the people, properly so-called, almost always arise from the concession of sovereigns and then that it can be traced uh, historically, but the rights of the sovereign and the aristocracy have neither date nor known authors. Uh, ba -ba -ba. Number five, although written laws are nothing but declarations of pre-existing rights, it is nowhere near possible for all of these rights to be written. And that's really interesting that a lot of the things that we take without granted that our rights are usually not actually written down in the constitutions of the Magna Carta. Um, and he's, number six, the more one writes, the weaker the Constitution. Uh, number seven, no nation can give itself liberty if it does not have it. Human influence does not extend beyond the development of existing rights. Uh, number eight, lawgivers, properly so called, are extraordinary men who perhaps only belong only to the ancient world and the youth of nations. 
Number nine, these legislators, even with their marvelous power, have only ever gathered together pre-existing elements and have always acted in the name of the deity. And in here, you could probably include other deities besides God there. But um, number 10, liberty is, in a sense, the gift of kings. For almost all free nations were constituted by kings. Number 11, there has never existed a free nation which did not have, in its natural constitution, seeds of liberty as old as itself, and no nation has ever successfully attempted to develop, by its uh, written laws, rights other than those which existed in its natural constitution. What he means there is that this idea of liberty that many of us held in the West, the only reason we have it is because liberty itself was generated through the people you know, over hundreds and hundreds, maybe even thousands of years. And let's use Britain as an example. Like the king didn't invent this desire for liberty. The desire for liberty existed in the people and it was codified by the king and its laws. But by that same token, you cannot take the Magna Carta and drop that into fucking Istanbul, into, you know, Africa, because it did the, the desire itself for liberty is not present in the people. And that's an interesting thing. I, so he would be more of a particularist and a, a multipolarist, if you wanted to say it like that. Um, no assembly of men, whatever, can constitute a nation. An enterprise of this kind must even be ranked among the most memorable acts of folly. So he's basically saying like a bunch of guys can't just get together and decide like to make a nation from scratch, which is kind of what we do right now. That's that's where you get sort of the managerial class uh, running rampant. And we'll get to that in another book later. But you'll see, like, this is a guy, staunch traditionalist, staunch monarchist. And yet he's speaking in the language almost of natural law, which seems very libertarian, very almost anarchistic. So he's he's using the same language as the Enlightenment era people that he's against, because they're always they're about nat natural laws at all. But he's saying, wait, what do you actually mean by natural? <laughs> let's talk about how, like let's talk about nature of how how each people is distinct and this idea that you can naturally say all ecosystems are the same makes no fucking sense. And the idea that you can just like walk into a place and just make a bunch of laws and that that will make people want liberty is actually insane. Um. He makes and he makes a, a funny point here that I always come back to. He says, while there are many types of sovereignties, even hybrid of you know democratic and monarchical, which is arguably what they have in Britain, he says, being a subject of one is nearly identical. And that's something I really want to underscore. I think people need to remember that when we talk about democracy, monarchy, all these different things, it's like, you know, existing in these are fundamentally the same like you are not actually afforded really many more rights or freedoms under this democracy we're living in right now than you would in a monarchy in the past being a subject is the exact same arguably you have less freedoms now you could get away with saying more things under a tyrant king than you can under this the freest democracy that has ever existed on earth so let's yeah. let's start with that yeah, yeah. He's got this thing here. I just want to read it. He says, the more one examines the play of human agency in forming political constitutions, the more one will be convinced that human agency enters into it only in an infinitely subordinate manner or as, sim or, or as a simple instrument. And I do not think the least doubt remains as to the incontestable truth of the following presuppositions, uh, propositions, rather. Number one. That the roots of political constitutions exist before any written law. Number two, that a constitutional law is and can only be the development or sanction of pre-existing or unwritten rights. Number three, that what is most essential, most intrinsically constitutional and truly fundamental is never written nor even can be without endangering the state. And four, that the weakness and fragility of a constitution are precisely in direct proportion to the multiplicity of written constitutional articles. So a good example of that would be Canada. Canada has a huge constitution and a very long declaration of human rights. It's there are a lot of words and a lot of caveats and a lot of fine print and asterisks is in there. And, you know, it's a mess. It's an absolute mess because it, Canada is the perfect example of a nation state that was not really generated from within. 
It was generated from above, from a managerial class. And that's why we find ourselves... That's why you find yourself in opposition to so many of these laws, because none of these laws came from the people. And I think we've kind of normalized that in, in our society, but that didn't used to be the feeling. The feeling was that we follow the laws because they're our laws. You're living in a country where you don't recognize these laws as your laws because they did not come from the people. And this idea that the managerial class can be so distant from the people means you're you're not we may not we don't even have sovereignty on the table you know what i mean yeah um and that's that's a very sad state of affairs but you know he's pointing to a certain logic that shows you what it could be uh yeah and and if it's not generated by the people it's usually generated by the king he says there's two ways constitutions are made germinated over time by the people through uh, fortuitous circumstances or by a single sovereign who appears and makes himself in charge which is a phenomenon that i find interesting and i think history bears it out that sometimes these these great societies a great king or a leader just shows up and these are usually the mythological founders and it, it just seem to have a a hold on people for whatever the reason is but that is that guy is truly becomes like one of the pillars of the civilization um you know one example he gave was uh, he had the example of the french olympics where you know it was this like weird uh, type of olympics they decided just to have in france and it borrowed the name but it didn't have the spirit of it so it's just a bunch of fucking frenchmen biking around like weirdos <laughs> um and he, and he when he talks about sovereignty almost as this again as an uh, almost an ontological entity that is inhabited by a person and it's either by a person or people. He also says that revolution also exists almost like an entity that is that is full of people, but it almost has a spirit of its own. He makes a claim that the French Revolution led led men more than it was led by men. You know, the revolution itself used the people, and in, he describes them as idiot crooks who were just riding the wave. He's got nothing but contempt for the French Revolution. Um and he has France really at the center of this whole book. You know, you, you read through this whole thing and it's it's using case studies from France. And the French monarchies, if you want to defend monarchy, the French monarchy is probably the best example to give because it stretches so far back in time. And he says, you know, the French monarchy goes back 1,400 years ago. It's pre-Christian. The in, entire organization of what we know as the French monarchy is not a Christian invention. He's, he basically says that the bishops just replaced druids, just put on a new type of hat. But it essentially was the same for 1,400 years. Um, and when he's talking about the French Revolution, I won't go too much into that. Um, and I would highly recommend people read this. But uh, he was making a, a very interesting case that the king of France, who was uh, killed during the, the revolution... He has this line here that says, the good are always sacrificed for the guilty. He's kind of likening that to Christ. He says, you know, Christ was sacrificed for us, for the guilty, the guilty, for the sinners. He says, the good are always sacrificed for the guilty. And in this case, the good king of France was sacrificed for the good of France. So what he does in this book that is so fascinating is he almost, he looks at revolution. He doesn't like the revolutionaries, but he does like the French revolution in an almost twisted way because he says first of all he says uh, blood is the fertilizer for this thing we call genius <laughs> so he says like in times of severe conflict that usually leads to some kind of golden age um so he's not anti-conflict he's not really anti-revolution he just sees it as this almost natural phenomena that just possesses the men and even when he sees the king killed this is how he was able to view that as a martyr because you know, even the people who look on Christ being crucified, you look at that as a great crime. But then you can kind of turn that around and say, no, he's dying for us. So he was saying that the king of France was dying for us at the hands of these fucking crooks. And his his martyrdom is going to lead to a, a better France in the future. That's what he was saying in the book. And um, and he said that's why he says he also says human sacrifice is natural and consecrated by the church. I don't know about that, but let's run with that. You know. <laughs> Um, and then he goes into uh, a lot of detail later, sort of detailing what how sovereignty actually operates, because I think people have sort of a, a, a twisted version of what the king actually is. Um, 
But he also says, like, this is why, like, a, so a sovereign itself, the sovereign entity, he says, without a sovereign, even in tribal settings, you don't need to have a great nation or a great city, but even in tribal settings, without a sovereign or someone occupying that space of sovereignty at the top of power, there can be no unity. And sovereignty itself is divinely ordained and isn't just a natural thing that happens. Um, it, it, it's because, like, a leader emerges. You know, someone it can't just have, and that's kind of what we try and build in this society, in this democracy, where we have this thing called sovereignty, but we almost don't want anyone to occupy it. We don't want anyone to be in charge, but we do have people in charge, but they pretend that they're not. Like it's this fucked up version of of power. Like no one would the the political class in America would deny up and down that they are in charge. It's probably because, you know, though they actually aren't in charge, that the uh, sovereignty of America is occupied, but it's not by politicians. That's the problem. But they the, and that part of that game is that the politicians would deny up and down that sovereignty even needs to exist. We don't need someone in charge. We don't need anybody in charge. You know, and it's actually good that no one can be in charge. But that everyone kind of knows that's a lie, because how could the most powerful nation in the world holding the entire world in its iron grip have no one or no people in charge of it only these sort of slave caretakers we call politicians everyone yeah. suspects that that's bullshit right um but then because if you really didn't have a sovereign you wouldn't have freedom because his main thesis is that freedom and liberty can only be guaranteed and granted by a sovereign whether that is a king or an aristocracy it literally and if you don't have that you don't have freedom because freedom needs structure freedom you know without anarchy you know an anarchist you know utopia would be you know slaves you know to exist in total freedom with no slavery you almost need to be a subject within some kind of large system called a society called a civilization and then the idea is that if you don't have anyone in charge of that, then it kind of doesn't exist. So I, I, maybe I'm repeating myself, but I just wanted to make that part clear that, that you almost looked at like a specter or something. Um, and I guess I'll just um, I'll wrap up with a couple lines here. There's a lot that I could go into, but I know we're kind of running out of time and I run the risk of uh, kind of repeating myself. Um, but th there's a few lines here that I liked. He said the power of sovereignty cannot be limited or div uh, divided and to limit it is to destroy it um you know in britain where power is divided it only succeeds in fighting itself you know and he's got a uh, one line here that kind of shows uh, the summary of the relationship here he said it can be said in general that all men are born for monarchy this government is the oldest and the most universal before the time of Theseus, there was no question of a republic in the world. Democracy especially was so rare and so fleeting that it is permissible to ignore it. Monarchical government is so natural that men identify it with sovereignty without realizing it. They seem to be tacitly agreed that there is no true sovereign wherever there is no king. I've given some examples which would be uh, easy to multiply. This observation is especially striking in all that has uh, been said for or against the question which forms the subject of the first book of this work. Um, opponents of divine origin always rail against kings and speak only of kings. They do not want to believe that the authority of kings comes from God. But it is not a question of royalty in particular. It is a question of sovereignty in general. Yes, all sovereignty comes from God in whatever form it exists. It is not the work of man. It is one absolute and involute and uh, invalid by its uh, nature. Why then is it a question of royalty as if the inconvenience is relied on upon? Blah, 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 blah. That, that is because, once again, monarchy is the natural government and is confounded with sovereignty in ordinary discourse by disregarding other governments, just as the exception is neglected by stating the general rule. So he's basically making, I think, a very fascinating case. He's like marrying this sort of Enlightenment era idea of natural law which is where you get your, your John Stuart Mills and everything about, you know, the social contract. But he's using that to justify monarchy. And you by justifying the monarchy as a practical way, he's also justifying 
this sort of divinity that lurks behind the monarchy. And I think if people wanted to maybe not be so Catholic about it, there is a sort of, you, you could transmogrify this into something like a national spirit or th th no one would deny that there's a spirit of the people, a sort of divinity of the people and that you, you know, it goes without saying and that all these laws come from the people, but it's almost like it's magic. It's almost like it's this ethereal thing. And as long as you, I think, keep the sort of the construction of nation in that sort of quasi spiritual realm, I think it becomes easier to understand it. And I think once you view it through that lens and look at sovereignty as such, look at sovereignty, not as this wishy washy thing, but as like, uh, uh, like an existential thing that's occupying it by an individual. I think, you know, the relationship of people and power makes a lot more sense. Now, did anything I say make any sense there? Yeah. By the way. Yeah, yeah, I think I get it. Okay, good. And, he, you know, he goes in later to defend, you know, the king. And he, we've talked about this before, so I didn't want to say it too, too much here. But he would say that, you know, in great detail, he said, like, the king's role is not to be like this god emperor. The king himself is kept in check by the priest class and by these other individuals. Um, for example, like the king cannot kill. A lot of people didn't know that. Um, the king, actually, it's, it's illegal for the king to kill anyone. Um, and the king never weighs in on small matters. So the greatest fear with kings is always, oh, the king's going to come over and fuck my wife. Like, there's a whole system <laughs> in place to keep the king from doing that. Like you would never see the king. The king wouldn't weigh in on your affairs. And he has got a whole system of dukes and princes and, and little like um, guys who just run the neighborhood, you know, your, your mayor essentially. <laughs> so it's like this idea of the king as this sort of God emperor who's, you know, drinking wine in a Caligula fashion that didn't exist. And not only did not exist, you know, if the king was, you know, running out of hand keep in mind that the king was just seen as the latest occupant of the sovereign so it's not like if the king died they didn't know what to do <laughs> they had the entire system would devour that king if he lost his mind and then the system would keep going but you know the idea that you do have one individual in the pilot seat means something and if you don't have that i think the idea was that if people cannot look up and see an individual sitting, which is what people are essentially doing when they vote for a president. They hope they're voting for a sovereign and they never get it. They never can. Biden is not a sovereign. Trump was not a sovereign. You can't actually elect one. You can't write one in. So, But then when people look up into this place where they expect to see the leader, the sovereign, the, the manifestation of the spirit of the nation, they don't see one there. They, they, they don't have spirit. They start going crazy. They start fucking. That's that's our society right now that we don't have anyone really occupying this space. And we're just hoping that this thing keeps going, but it's really just falling apart because there's no unification and you cannot have unification without a sovereign. You cannot have any unity, you can't even have liberty. And then we look around and say, where is our liberty gone? And so back to the thing we were talking about before all this, this is why we can't stop trying to elect grifters. This is why we can't stop shopping for sovereigns in all the wrong places. And you're not going to be able to... If, if a sovereign emerges, if a leader emerges for any nation, any city, any empire, any movement, any revolution, it's not going to be because you picked him. He's going to make himself the leader by by it will seem divinely ordained when he shows up not to necessarily say he was hand selected by god but he will have something about him that that unifies people but what i can assure you is it will not emerge by committee now that might be a good place to end as any so what did you think of all that yeah that's it's interesting it's it's interesting to hear a defense of it is not something that's commonly defended now so yeah, I'm not surprised at the take that we have uh, like our, our ostensibly democratic government. Um, it's it's in their interest to kind of wash away sovereignty and like gaslight us into believing that sovereignty is not important because, of course, their system has usurped it. You know, 
So it's interesting. All right. I know you're really sick and you got to get going to bed too. You got kids flying all around you. Yes, sir. All right. So that was a good place. We'll probably, I'm going to be mentioning this book more and more because I think it occupied, I think a lot about sovereignty these days in a geopolitical sense. Um, And some people might think it's maybe a bit silly to speak of it in such spiritual terms, but I I think the Catholic defense of it here, uh, you know, locked in its time as it is, is still very relevant. And I would encourage people to look at their national sovereignty, you know, in this as the sort of spirit that can be occupied by a person, like look at it in that way. And that's a very uh, illuminating way to look at the, the, the government itself. Do not let the rapists win. Listen and love Blood Satellite.